Welcome to our panel, uh, Conversation on Culture and Conflict, uh, organized jointly by Conflux Center for Intercultural Dialogue and Mediation, China Foreign Affairs University, and the University of Arts in Belgrade. Uh, there are two essential factors to remember when we are talking about cultures. One is that cultures are constantly changing. And second, that they relate to the symbolic dimension of life. The symbolic dimension of life is where we construct meaning and enact our identities. Since culture is closely related to our identities and the ways we make meaning, which means uh, what is important, what is priority, uh, what is just, what is expected from the other party. Taking all this into account, culture is always a factor in conflict. We have seasoned experts on this panel with extensive academic work and practical experience in studying, negotiating, and mediating conflicts across culture. I will start by introducing the panelists and posing some opening questions. The Q&A uh, feature at the bottom of your screen has already been activated, and I invite the audience to participate in the discussion by posting their questions. We will try to cover as many questions as possible. If you wish to make a comment, uh, please use the chat feature. It is my honor and my pleasure to introduce our three esteemed panelists. Miriam Coronel Ferrer, a professor of politics at the University of the Philippines, served as senior mediation advisor in the United Nations standby team of mediators for three years. Previously, she headed the Philippine government panel that negotiated and signed a comprehensive agreement on Bangsamoro with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front in 2014. As the chair of the government panel, Miriam made history as the first female chief negotiator in the world to sign a final peace accord with the rebel group. She continued in this capacity to oversee the implementation of the agreement on Bagsamoro in the first two years. In 2015, she received the Hillary Rodham Clinton Award for Advancing Women in Peace and Security, given by Georgetown University. Alistair Crook, director and founder of Conflicts Forum based in Beirut and Italy. He was formerly advisor on Middle East issues to Javier Solana, the EU foreign policy and security chief. He was also a member of Senator George Mitchell's fact-finding committee that inquired into the causes of the Intifada, 2000-2001 Palestinian Intifada, and was advisor to the International Quartet on Middle East. He facilitated various ceasefires in the occupied territories and the withdrawal of occupying forces on two occasions. Alistair has had 20 years experience working with Islamist movements, such as Hamas, Hezbollah, and Islamist movements in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and the Middle East. He's a member of the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations Global Experts. He is also the author of the book, Resistance, The Essence of the Islamist Revolution. And he is a frequent contributor in the international press, both writing articles and TV and radio commentary. Emmanuel Habuka Bombande is a United Nations Senior Mediation Advisor. In 2017, he served as a Senior Mediation Advisor to the head of the UN Multidimensional Integrated Stabilization Mission, MINUSCA, in the Central African Republic. Prior to that, he was Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Regional Integration of the Republic of Ghana. He also worked with the United Nations Office for West Africa and Sahel. He co-founded and was Executive Director of the West Africa Network for Peace Building for over 10 years. He's a peace building scholar, practitioner, and international trainer in conflict mitigation and prevention across Africa and beyond with a strong background in conflict analysis. 
He has been a lead mediator in many community-based mediation efforts in West Africa. I'm Milos Struger, uh, Director of Conflux Center. I would like to begin uh, with a broad question for our panelists. While only a small segment of culture is visible on the surface, the powerful core of meaning lies in the depths of the collective psyche. From these depths comes our perception of ourselves, of the other, and of relationships, dictates our moral and evolved views, our beliefs and judgments. It is a complex task to reveal these depths and reach across cultures. And the question is, is it possible and how to address these complexities? May I start with you, Miriam, please. Thank you, Milos, and a good day to everyone, to your fellow co-organizers of this conference from the China Foreign Affairs University, as well as uh, University of Arts Belgrade, and hello to my co-panelists, Mr. Alistair and Emmanuel. Um, you, first, let me say, um, Milos, that culture is not exactly hidden, it's out there. It's out there in the symbols that uh, we see in the constructs that have shaped the kinds of nation states that we have now. I think we know for a fact that most of the conflicts besetting the world today are intrastate conflicts. And much of that really has to do with the way nation states have been constructed, drawing on cultural resources that are predominantly drawn uh, taken from the dominant cultural majorities. Um, so states, accordingly, were fashioned along the lines of uh, uh, the symbols, uh, the languages, the language, uh, the religion, precisely, of those who dominate the state. And that's, you know, the sense that is true at the national level as well as in, in the global level. We see this kind of uh, um, carry carry over of the cultural cons the way states have been constructed. For instance, let me give examples from uh, this region in Southeast Asia. Uh, in uh, Thailand, there is a uh, the, the motto lies on the notion of religion, which is of course Buddhism, the nation, and the king. And these are really symbols of the dominant majority. Now we know that in southern part of Thailand, largely as a result of colonial rule, there is a Malay Muslim minority uh, and uh, of a different religion, of a different language, but they have been precisely forcibly integrated into the dominant ideological cultural frame of the Thai nation state. I mean, there are many, many other examples of uh, such ethnocentrism that we see in a lot of states, and we see this kind of translation as well in the kinds of political system, the systems of representations that have emerged from, uh, from such constructs, uh, for instance, political parties built along ethnic and religious lines, um, social policies that, are, that swing from acute segregation to uh, acute assimilationist policies, and uh, differentiated spo uh, social spaces, as well as differentiated citizenship rights across the different cultural groups. So what much of the conflict that we are precisely seeing today lie, uh, have these origins in these kinds of national, social, and political constructs. And the minority populations that have felt unduly incorporated, unduly underrepresented in such systems are the ones really now that are be begging or asking uh, precisely for a change in these very constructs. So in that sense, when we talk about mediation and precisely trying to find solutions to many of these types of interstate conflicts, um, what's, it's very, very important that we come up with a very good conflict analysis because it's one thing to say, oh, there's poverty because sometimes poverty, ethnicity uh, also coincide. It might be 
the case that a lot of states believe that development will solve all of this and that's not very far away from you know a rather outdated modernization theory that everything will become similar precisely with economic development so they might miss out precisely on the core identity issues that underlie in many of these conflicts so conflict analysis should be precisely not be blind to these kinds of social constructs that are being perpetuated and are precisely being resisted by the other segments of the population. In this regard, I will say that discourse analysis as part of conflict analysis is certainly a very important approach because it's very important to look at these symbols, these narratives that have defined the differences across different segments of the population within one state you know, anything from prejudices, biases, artifacts, these are all part of the contested, contested identities that have uh, marked that kind of, that have led to a lot of the violence that we are seeing today. And of course, let's not forget the gender constructs that are also embedded in many of these things. Um, women is very much uh, affected by the way, the gender cultures that are very much present. Uh, so what do we what do we do now? Uh, I think moving beyond the states, we find that also movements are affected precisely by these differences in cult, in in cultural um, predisposition and cultural uh, perspectives. For instance, in our case, we have a communist party of the Philippines with the New People's Army, but in one part of the country, in the northern part of the country, where we have a distinct set of ethnic minorities. This eventually led to a split precisely within the Communist Party movement on the grounds of ethnic discrimination within the Communist Party. So we see this kind of complications precisely happening, not only by the way states have been constructed, but also the way some uh, totalizing movements have also constructed their own ideological programs. So I think um, there are many more things to say, I think, in terms of um, cultures and subcultures that operate, for instance, in our negotiations with the more Islamic Liberation Front, I come from the dominant, uh, dominant majority, dominant religion, dominant, uh, you know, um, I, I come from the center, the center and the south, where our Muslim minority population are, are what might basically be described in the periphery. So much of our understanding, much of our understanding of the conflict and our dealings with the other party had to be informed precisely of these um, cultural, cultural sensitivities um, uh, and cultural proclivities that even within the same nation can certainly you know, manifest itself uh, glaringly. Of course, uh, much of that had to be, um, uh, had to be observed. Uh, we know, for instance, how important face saving um, uh, face saving is in many of these uh, in, in many of these traditional cultures so that uh, that kind of sensitivity is required in dealing with very very difficult issues and being able to uh, negotiate in a manner that will be that will not complicate emotionally and psychologically the other party with whom we are negotiating especially considering the fact that the other party is not made up of different ethnic groups in the case of the more islamic liberation front they're also made up of different ethnic groups and each ethnic group would have their own proclivities. And I realized, for instance, that during the negotiations, we were dealing mostly with one type of ethnic group, but my own academic background and my own exposure as a civil society activist as well has been more, uh, has, has been, you know, more on the other ethnic group. And I found myself really, really trying to understand this more specific um, uh, ethnic community with whom we are mo we were mostly dealing with in order for me to you know read between the lines to see behind the poker faces and also to be able to precisely um, uh, avoid the, uh, the em emotional landmines that can unduly upset any negotiation process i think i'll end there there as i said there is more to say uh, Many of these issues, of course, have been resolved through special territorial autonomy arrangements, precisely acknowledging both uh, the, the distinctiveness of a certain 
certain uh, cultural groups uh, well defined in uh, specific geographic spaces as well as um, uh, certain power share arrangements that enable the cultural minorities to be able to share in the national power but also to be exercised to, to be able to exercise more political power within their areas of domain. Um, I'll end there, Milosh, and I hope that we will continue this, uh, this with other questions later on. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, the, the culture identities, uh, they, they are a powerful instrument for state, uh, state power. But at the same time, they could, uh, uh, identities of minority groups can lead to fragmentation of the nation states. Uh, when the loyalty towards the state is replaced by loyalty towards a religion or clan or ethnic group. And it is uh, a, a factor in uh, many conflicts uh, nowadays. And uh, I read somewhere that there are more than 1,000 separatist movements at the moment. So this is really a, a, a a very important question when it comes to impact of culture in conflict. Alice, we would appreciate your views. I think I'm unmuted now. Hopefully you can hear. Uh, thank you very much. Um, of course, um, understanding culture is extremely important. Um, in analysis and preparation for negotiations. But I just would like to make um, really two points about this. Uh, first of all, I think that although that is important and the first speaker has just described it and Milos in his introduction, it's not nearly enough. Um, I recall from the first uh, efforts that um, mediation and negotiation I was involved with in Ireland uh, between the two armed groups, the Protestants and the Catholics. Um, putting them in a room together actually just made things worse, bringing them into a negotiation. It just confirmed their worst expectations of the other party, of otherness, if you like. And the real problem was not just cultural, but different histories and different different visions of the future. And of course, those histories are rooted in culture too. Cultures that stretch back, sometimes in the case of Ireland, 900 years. Um, also a very different culture from the Protestant community, um, reflecting tribulations and conflicts within Europe uh, from the 1300s. But the point was, that once we had realized our mistake in putting the two sides together, it took us four years to get to the point at which one party could say, that's not my history. I don't accept that history. I reject that history. I don't accept your vision of the future, but I do now see that you're expressing an authentic point of view for your community. And that took four years of work. So the role of the mediator is not just to analyze culture, sort of stand back, distance, and analyze it, but then really also to be able to move. We did that by making them write down their, their visions of the future and the visions of history. But you have to move towards a process by which one person would say, I don't accept your vision, I don't accept your argument, but I do now see you do have an argument. Only then politics becomes possible. Before that, maybe you can get a transitory or a tactical truce. You don't get a solution. You just get a timeout. And then the second point I just want to make, if I may, Milos, is the, about the fact that so much of this culture is hidden today because many people think of themselves as secular and therefore removed that they are empirical and they are rational and that they are not affected by culture. Just to take one example, I remember asking Madeleine Albright um, uh, at the time of the Camp David talks, why she refused to allow Arafat to talk to other Islamic leaders in the region. And she said, it's our policy. We are, don't pay any attention to religion. We excluded it from our thinking and therefore no one in State Department 
um, indeed takes into account anything to do with Islam or, or religion. Yet, the reality is, if that's what they think, most of what we see today is actually a secularized, a secularized vision of old religious myths. Even the American myth of exceptionalism was brought to them only by the Calvinists with their idea of the elect and of Judaism, which also has the sense of an elect. And even in Russia, with the Bolsheviks who did try and reduce and destroy culture and remove culture altogether, it was too a very secularized form of apocalyptic and ancient myths. The myth of redemption, redemption that was to be achieved now, not by divine involvement, not by divine change, but myths that come um, indeed um, from now to be changed into science, that it was science that was going to redeem mankind and no longer God or the divine sphere. So these things are there. So not only have you had to, to deal with two, if you like, very divergent views of history, and don't forget many wars are fought on the question of history. In Lebanon, there were wars fought because there are something like eight different versions of history of Lebanon. And wars are fought in this. And just to finish off, I would just like to say that even now, the British government, after this, I did, was talking about 20 years ago when I was involved with it between the IRA and the Protestant uh, military. Um, uh, even today, the British government has just had to announce that it's going to commission a new history of Ireland because they worry that the IRA version of history is gaining too much um, uh, uh, resonance uh, amongst the population and, and beyond. So we have to address that too. And that's almost even more difficult than simply just understanding where culture is in the normal sense of religion or Protestantism, Catholicism, or Islamism. Milos, thank you. Thank you, Alistair. Uh, so the, if I uh, understood uh, your uh, second point, well, the, the answer is not in the political science theory or uh, in intelligence capability, but uh, rather in understanding how the historical experience and psychology of the party has been formed. This is, uh, am I, did I get it right? You're still muted. No, am I okay now? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, I, the machine did it. Um, yes, it is, it is precisely that, that uh, Madeleine Albright, you know, thought she was acting in a very rational way and that he, she was not affected um, by these cultural aspects. But of course, the whole of American thinking is affected by the idea of the exceptionalism of the United States. And this exceptionalism is a form of secularized, if you like, a secularized mythology apocalyptic mythology of the elect in, in life. And this is something that has had a powerful influence on Western thinking, the idea of Western exceptionalism. But it is a myth that comes straight down to us from the apocalyptic tradition and is, was embedded and brought by the Pilgrim Fathers to, uh, to the United States. So it's so difficult to understand these things if you don't um, can't get Madeleine Albright to accept that she is acting out a religious myth, even though she feels she's being very scientific and secular. And she can't understand China, of course, because she can't understand uh, China has none of that myth of redemption, either in Confucianism or Taoism, and therefore is not doesn't have that missionary zeal that the United States has to shape and reform the world and bring the world to a sort of form of secular redemption. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Emmanuel, we would like to hear your take on this uh, issue. Please. Yes, uh, Ambassador Struga, can you hear me? We can hear you very well. Uh, I, I lost most of the conversation because the audio has been intermittent, but I'm going to try to uh, communicate my quick uh, thinking and let's see how this works out. So first of all, I want to appreciate the opportunity uh, to be with the distinguished panelists uh, to make this contribution. When we think about uh, culture in conflict, the first thing that comes to my mind is the appreciation of culture in itself being the window of each of us in our various societies, if I were to put it that way, to the world. And so we are in a constant struggle to present ourselves to others in terms of how they understand us in the way we communicate, the way we uh, carry ourselves, whether it is attributed to the way we speak and the type of clothes we wear and the rest of those attributes. Now, the challenges, when we then find ourselves in conflict, this becomes heightened to the level in which we want to be understood in the context that identifies us and makes us to be seen across the world and for that matter, other societies and particularly our adversaries. The first challenge therefore is, how is there a level of communication that takes us to a deeper level of understanding of one another? And unfortunately, a lot of the issues in conflict are presented sometimes as political challenges, but we see that at a structural level, culture is a cross-cutting element. And what we often are not able to do significantly and with much impact is to consider the cultural dimension and elements in whatever engagement we are uh, about to enter into. So whether it's in the Balkans, whether it's in the Horn of Africa, uh, particularly in the Horn of Africa with what we see happening today, how is the deeper level of communication capable of bringing people from the Tigray, the Amhara, the Oromo to be able to have an understanding of what is happening amongst them beyond the dynamics of politics in a federated state. And this for me is a very uh, important element. Related to that at the second level is that when we talk about culture in conflict, invariably, we're talking about the type of values inherent in the parties that find themselves in the conflict. And those inherent values are human. And so we can be able to accept that the interactions of society makes it possible for us to begin to see and appreciate other people's values and cultures in order that we can be able to relate. But this is where it becomes challenging. When the conflict is protracted, it is intractable. And yet the approaches and the mechanisms that we have today are not sufficient or are inadequate, even including how we politically engage, it leaves us with a huge deficit in terms of how we are able to reach down and how we are able to assess the influence of culture in these conflicts. And that is why we often fall short and are far away from a comprehensive outcome that appears to be a way forward. And let me quickly add on to that, that even where the efforts have been able to reach a reasonable outcome, because of the deficit in how the cultural permeation 
becomes relevant, we sometimes see agreements being signed as an outcome of a negotiated settlement, but they are only signed without a cultural acknowledgement of the impediments that are prevalent. So what that means is a party could be at the table signing the agreement, but culturally they have not committed to the agreement, but they are signing the agreement to please all the parties, including the mediators who are around the table. And the mediators are not able to determine the level of commitment. And so the agreements have never been uh, truly accepted at that deeper level of a commitment, and yet they were signed onto. And that for me is relevant. And my third point to be able to conclude is putting all this together in the conversation of culture in conflict. We need to be able to see how in the way forward in asking the question about the useful and proactive ways of uh, mediating in conflicts, appreciate that there is no conflict we do not bring in on board these cultural values that we talk about. And so the start off point is the level to which our international community has engaged to be able to put on the table a collective agreement beginning with the Charter of the United Nations, looking at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, looking, looking at international humanitarian law. Could that be a basis of the conversation that begins to check on whether we are all comfortable enough to start a conversation and whether those international values that we have been able to negotiate as standard that is applicable everywhere has truly been acceptable by the parties in a conflict in order that we are able to then put on the specific cultural values that pertain to the different parties in order to begin the conversation. So if we begin a conversation, but there are no shared values because cultures are an impediment, why do we expect that we can have a reasonable outcome? And so that then becomes a question in which the forms of cultural perceptions need to be part of the deeper level of understanding, acknowledgement, and acceptance of what is prevalent in order to even begin the dialogue. So bringing people to the table also requires taking into account and on board what those cultural values mean as a preparation to begin the conversation. Uh, let me stop here and be very happy to come back and join. But uh, I hope the uh, audio gets better, but I have those difficulties at the moment. Uh, but uh, we, we could hear you very well. It was uh, very clear, Emmanuel. Uh, that's an interesting, uh, very important point uh, Emmanuel raised. Universal values enshrined in the UN Charter in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, International Humanitarian Law. All of them were ratified by all the all the countries, all the nations. But uh, also Emmanuel raised the issue, is there cultural commitment to the agreement signed? And uh, that also applies to this universal values. Is there a cultural commitment to these universal values, although they were ratified and signed? And I would like to hear, Alistair, uh, if you have any comment on this. Um, thank you. Yes, Milos, I, I do. Um, uh, really, um, of course, it has been signed by, by many people, um, the Universal Declaration, many states. Uh, but whether it is accepted culturally, as one of the other speakers have said, is another issue. Uh, the human rights, the whole dialogue of human rights, was something that emerged out of Europe at a particular time uh, and was became part of, if you like, a, a, a dominant narrative um, about the future of the world, again, progressivism. Uh, it is that whole concept of progressing towards something where we converge is very much 
a, a Christian idea that has become taken on a secular form in the present world. Um, so I don't think it is necessarily so. And we know very clearly that how people look, how different civilizational st nation states look at human rights is very different. China, for example, puts the weight on community, the, the rights of community, the rights of a community, the rights of peoples. We put the emphasis on the rights of individuals and see them, if you like, in conflict um, with community quite often or community in conflict with them. So I don't think you can assume that we have, if you like, a core of, of values. And I, I started off by talking about the Irish problem, which was one of the first sort of uh, negotiations I was involved in. I mean, these people occupy the same piece of land, yet they have such a completely different, if you like, vision of a future and vision of their history. And they could never agree in it and still cannot agree on that. So where do you go and how do you take it forward? And that is why I suggested that the only way you can do that is that you have to do the hard slog, which took us then four years. Once they lay down their, their incompatible visions for their future and for their past from their opposite numbers to take them and then said, okay, but do you accept now that someone else can have a different view, different truth, different history, and that that is what they sincerely believe. Only when you can get to that point of acceptance, it is not a cultural buy-in because they don't buy into it culturally at all. They don't buy into the history, they don't buy into the vision of the future. But only when you get to the point after a lot of work between the two parties. This is why I say it's not just understanding, it's actually actively getting both parties to say, okay, I now accept. I don't like it, I don't accept it, but I now understand that that's how they think. And that is an authentic way of thinking. And yes, I have mine, they have theirs. Now, only there can you move to politics and to compromise. Before that, when people won't accept that the other side has a position, has a point of view, you don't have compromise, you might have a tactical truce for a short period, but no real uh, lasting uh, solution to the problem. Uh, thank you, thank you, Alistair. Uh, Miriam, uh, in the field of international relations, it is important to understand cultural symbols and the both Emmanuel and Alistair were emphasizing the need for understanding, not necessarily uh, accepting, but understanding. Uh, simply because one idea or one action uh, can mean different things to different cultures. Uh, you, you had so much experience uh, in uh, negotiating and also mediating across cultures. Uh, how, what you did, uh, what, what tools and skills are helpful to, to better understand, to improve communication and understanding of the other's point of view? Can you share some with us, please? And maybe just as a part of this, there is a question from Jyoti. Uh, it says uh, some harmful social and traditional cultures create an arrest in community in the form of gender discrimination, caste discrimination, and so on. How do we need to take such culture? So how we, we uh, what tool, is there any tools and skills that uh, could be helpful to transcend this uh, uh, barriers and improve communication and understanding of the other party? Thank you, Miriam. Maybe for a, a, a third party or maybe even first parties to negotiation, it's really very important to have uh, also diversity within your own ranks because that diversity, especially if drawing also from uh, communities of the other party or the parties involved, will help you be able to see things better. So, for instance, it was very important for us to have as part of our team, and not just the negotiating team, but 
the slew of um, consultants and uh, project, you know, um, peace officers that were that came with us uh, all, th all through the, the years of negotiation, that many of them actually had uh, friends or actually belong to this community so that they can translate to us some of the things that were going on. Uh, because maybe our eyes were seeing things differently. We were hearing different things coming precisely from outside of the culture. It was important for us to get the feedback precisely from those people who are who belong to these uh, communities as well. And that's where you get into a lot of trouble. Like, for instance, if you're dealing with an Islamic group and you don't have an Islamic uh, Sharia law expert with you, then you won't be able to take, talk the same language. Many of the concepts that they were um, that they were advocating to be part of the uh, political arrangement drew from Islamic principles. And we had to converse with them within that framework. So it was also very important for us that we, we precisely had this, that those kinds of expertise or they were actually part of our team so that they can be more effective, in fact, in talking to the other party. I mean, uh, an Islamic scholar in our team talking about the rights of women had certainly more impact than if I were doing it, coming from outside of the society and coming from, uh, well, uh, from maybe say uh, a more secularized or even uh, westernized uh, educational background or something like that. So that's very important. The diversity, the different perspectives, the different uh, kinds of inputs that you get as part of your own uh, team. You cannot come with a solid view of how things are because then you don't really get anywhere. I think in our negotiations, for instance, it was very, very important that we first you know, we first acknowledge precisely the importance of the identities, the identity that they have been fighting for. And that loosened up a lot of things. One of the first documents that we signed had this item that went something like this. It's number one in the sort of 10 points, 10 uh, initial points of consensus. It simply went like this. Um, the parties acknowledge the uh, legitimacy of the Bangsamoro identity, and that's how they frame their uh, identity, and the grievances uh, that they have uh, that uh, that underlie the conflict. And that, you know, that kind of core uh, acknowledgement uh, made it easier to look into the very, very particular, in the many, many particulars having to do with what kind of autonomy it will be, the kind of wealth sharing arrangements that will happen how DDR will happen. It all started with precisely that kind of already uh, a common ground. And that's a shared value that we are acknowledging their unique identity, that they have a legitimate space within the national space, within the, the national construct. And therefore we will be able to find, or we should be able to find ways and means to be able to look into the details, the devils in the details of any political negotiations. Thank you very much, Alice. Sorry, it keeps going off and coming back up. Um, I think you asked the question about what could we do to, if you like, um, to help that understanding. In my experience, I mean, there are two things that uh, I've done. First of all, there is a need, and this is certainly a reflection in the Middle East. Uh, people psychologically need to have somehow a recognition of the wrongs that have been done to them. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, reparations or punishment or whatever. But for example, when dealing with the Palestinian uh, groups in Israel, the, it was very important for them to hear from the principals who were responsible that they at least acknowledged that Palestinians had suffered wrongly in certain conditions. And that this was a part, that psychological aspect was highly important. 
not just about understanding it. It's about someone having to say something. They didn't have to say, oh, yes, you're right. We did something wrong. But they had to find the words that said, yes, maybe crimes were committed. Maybe you suffered from this. Um, and we do acknowledge that happened. Not necessarily accepting the full blame, but saying something. This is very important for getting to the next stage of, of, of an understanding. Then again, with in the, the Iranian negotiations with Iran, um, what made the difference was the sort of sense of an open consciousness um, that someone is capable of listening and just hearing deeply what is being said to them. And I have to regrettably say that most Westerners don't have that ability. Um, they're so anxious, you can see them sitting there almost ready to sort of ask them their question uh, and to argue. And they see the way forward by argument rather than actually feeling and sensing what lies behind what someone is saying to you. Because quite often it's opaque what they're saying. They're talking in analogs or in metaphors that you don't quite understand. So you have to really be patient, listen very hard, but open in a consciousness, which is something different from just sort of sitting there and listening. Milos. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, Manuel, you have a lot of experience uh, with uh, uh, mediating, but also negotiating uh, conflicts in Africa. And uh, uh, Alistair just mentioned the, the importance of uh, using metaphors and uh, uh, storytelling. How important is narrative storytelling metaphors in conflict resolution in Africa. And the sub-question to this is when uh, uh, we are talking about intercommunal conflict, is really the focus, can you, can you hear me, Emmanuel? I see that you are, yeah. I'm so sorry, I'm not hearing you, but uh, uh, could Emilia just frame it in the box and I can read it and respond, or I could, the intermittent picking up I do, I understood the complexity of cultural diversity and how that then can be uh, a, an obstacle to how we seek peace, is that correct? Uh, not the, actually, how important is narrative, storytelling, metaphors in conflict resolution? No. We have a we have a problem. Maybe Emily, I can. I'm afraid I might be responding to you, but not the uh, right question. <laughs> that is my challenge. How important? Okay, I'm getting it now. How important is narrative storytelling in conflict resolution? Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Emilia. I, I think uh, uh, Ambassador Struga you are bringing into the conversation a fundamental element that is in itself important to unblock the protractedness in the conversations around culture. Because first of all, people want to be able to tell their stories from their cultural aspirations and cultural values. But we are sometimes eager as mediators and as third parties to have our own template about how people come to the table and how they are able to talk. And we try to design those processes according to our own expertise and not according to the aspirations of the very people we want to bring to the table. Now, when I worked in the Central African Republic, what one thing that was very predominant was that when you listen to various groups in the north of the Central African Republic, in Birao, in Bambari, they begin the conversation about how Central Africa started from their own communities. But it was colonization that shifted the capital to the South. Now, what then happens is people treat each other and assume that it is okay to treat the other person the way they are treating them without knowing the 
hurt that they are bringing to the other communities. I think that we must allow and create the space for all groups to be able to tell their story. But we should be able to allow the, the storytelling to happen in such a way that the other side is able to listen to the story. Because it's not just about telling the story, but the communities want their story to be validated, to be listened to, to be heard by their adversary. They want the adversary, they want the enemy to understand that in case you do not know, this is who we are and this is our story. And the more we do that, the more we bring a cross-cultural effect that now makes it possible for inclusion. And the inclusion here is not because people are sitting together. The inclusion here is that each side is telling their story for the other to be able to listen attentively and at a deeper level of that story. When we are able to do all that, I believe we can begin now the journey towards what we call a mediated outcome. But if the mediation is happening without a good storytelling, then the mediation is not going to be successful. And in the example I chose to conclude, uh, since uh, time is not our friend, the mediation happened without allowing the people to tell their story. In fact, the mediation happened when the mediator hit the table and said, we must have an agreement in the next two weeks because we cannot be here for longer than that. And so everybody just went across the emotions, but the story was not told. And that became our problem, uh, Ambassador Sugar. Uh, over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, just uh, maybe Emmanuel, a uh, question from Wangari. Uh, do you incorporate traditional conflict management processes in your mediation efforts? Do you see question from Wangari? I think uh, uh, we, we, we lost it. Uh, question from Nasir. Trying to address the acceptance of the otherness and the cultural differences between the disputed parties. I suppose it's more complicated as the cultural differences in this case are governed by mistrust, the feeling of enmity and predetermined positions against each other. So addressing the cultural differences should be after trust building, which should incorporate it interconnected to accepting the other. It looks like paradoxical. Uh, and uh, I, I would like to hear you, Miriam, and then Alistair on this point. Should we focus on building trust? Can we build trust between the parties which are in conflict? And uh, is this the way to approach before addressing this uh, uh, otherness, acceptance of otherness and cultural differences. First, Miriam Denalis, please. And that's very much like the chicken and egg question. Well, I think we know very well that uh, trust building happens in every phase of a process. I mean, even before you get to sit down, there has to be a lot of trust building. And much of the trust building is precisely showing that kind of appreciation of what the others, the other, appreciation of the other, the totality of the other, and that certainly includes um, uh, that, that their ways of life, their, um, uh, their grievances, certainly that's all of, all of this. Um, and I remember, for instance, uh, uh, Yusuf Kala, the vice president of Indonesia, uh, advising his negotiators uh, to actually eat in the actionist food stalls in Jakarta way, way before they faced the other party. And that's part of getting to know them, learning their folk songs, being able to eat their food, appreciate their food, and being able to understand precisely the whole dimension of the problem in order for them to be more effective when they come across the table. So trust building is something that is very much uh, uh, that happens uh, at the very beginning when the initial contacts are being made. I mean, you don't just say, hey, you show first that kind of understanding and precisely the desire to find a solution. And then you get down to the next steps from uh, 
uh, all the way to the formal process and all the way to the implementation. In each of this step, your perception of the other will always be challenged, will still be suspect, in fact. And that kind of consistency, that kind of sincere, sincere appreciation and understanding of where the other is coming from really um, is the is the, is the one that seals the trust uh, for the long haul because any process takes a long long time now we're talking about the grief a grief party the other party needs the same the same confidence of uh, to be you know to be developed on on the other party's side vis-a-vis -vis, for instance the government and uh, or the state the the vis-a-vis -vis the other party. So the other party certainly has to also exhibit uh, some of these uh, through different manifestations. For instance, uh, the one important statement uh, that made government comfortable in our negotiations with the More Islamic Liberation Fund is when they said, we are, we are Bangsamoro by national identity, but we are Filipino citizens. And that indicated to the state that precisely once that identity is acknowledged, then independence is no longer uh, the one that's still being negotiated. So it's a two-way thing that has to happen um, every step of the way. They, we try to understand them, and certainly they also have to try to understand uh, us. And in that manner, we are able to find ways and means by which trust can be further solidified. Thank you, Miriam. You also answered uh, uh, a question from George Zakaria. Thank you for this. Alistair, can we uh, hear your views, your perspective on this? Yes, I question. think I come from I think I come from a somewhat different context than the last speaker because um, nearly all my uh, sort of negotiations have been with parties who are in much deeper conflict to the extent, for example, that I mean, in, in some of those occasions, there's no trust. I go into a room and they carefully lay down a Kalashnikov pointing at me before I start the discussion. So, I mean, you don't have a great deal of sort of going out and eating with people when you have a Kalashnikov deliberately pointing at you for the beginning of a talk. Um, and I think really that what I'm going to say to you, in, in a sense, I think there's too much been too much discussion here on um, agreement, I mean, and trust. I don't think I know of one where there was a really trust. Uh, and I would certainly not advise my negotiators, I mean, certainly negotiating with hostages, which I've done um, a, a number of times, I would tell the negotiator never to trust. Uh, and also, there are always two levels to a negotiation. Uh, and in conflicts um, and in hostages, you never tell the negotiator what is going on at the other level. So your negotiator is kept basically uninformed because you want separately to have a military option that may unfold at the same time. And that's not just in hostage negotiations, it happens in other ones. You find the bomb goes off suddenly. Someone is using an act of violence to put pressure on the negotiator or from the other party. Um, so there are always these two levels and therefore um, uh, trust um, is not something I, I would recommend. And the negotiator was kept in the dark so that he couldn't give way or know that there may be something militarily unfolding. And as a negotiator, sometimes you didn't know that something like that was about to uh, 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 to unfold. But finally, Milos, what I was going to sort of finish on was actually, you know, rather than talking about agreement, I mean, actually, we're talking about arranging, sort of finding arrangements for pluralism. Not so much an agreement, but how do you manage pluralism in a society, either within a particular nation, like in Ireland, um, where there was no trust for me or, or, and certainly as a negotiator. I used to sit down at the table with the IRA and they would spend, you know, they would come up and with much glee tell me how they've just killed the last um, people like me or kneecapped them or killed them. And um, 
how do you how do you do this? I think it's basically by finding a sort of pluralistic um, system. I mean, of course, they get to know they get to know you. Is that enough? I don't think it's enough. I think you have to also find and understand how you can make little spaces for people that they can live in. They can keep their culture and their identities within some broader, if you like, community arrangement. So I think too much emphasis on sort of expecting or thinking you can get a, single, a singularity of outcome. It should be um, much more pluralistic, Milos. So, uh, would you say then that uh, uh, extremism is basically a culture misunderstanding? You know, I have huge problems with the word extremism. I mean, you know, I've spent most much of my life dealing with people who have been described as extremists and terrorists and put on terrorist list. And then the next, you know, time moves on, the will goes round, and the government ministers the next time. So I don't, I, I don't really, I, I don't really see that sense. And I completely disagree with the idea. I've always told negotiators. Never say that the um, make is a precondition for going into negotiations that the other side has to give up their weapons and to lay down and agree to nonviolence. I know that that is a very common liberal position in the world, but my experience with armed groups, they never will do that. And if you try and do that, you'll find that they will do it um, by concealment. And I've seen many of the the negotiations I've been involved with break down precisely on that issue. The West wants to say, well, you have to go into political discussions, you can't keep your weapons. But of course, the government or the state keeps its weapons. So why should the other parties, the minority parties, not keep their weapons until they are satisfied? In other words, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And part of that is, includes weapons. They won't give up weapons until they see that everything is going to be agreed. Then they might give them up. But to try and front load it by this conditionality, in my view, is usually a mistake. What is important, though, is to try and build bypasses around that so that if there is an incident of violence, a bomb goes off and there's an outrage and there's a great thing, how can you get around it and not just have a complete break off and a breakdown in the negotiations? You need to devise a sort of bypass route agreed by the parties that if something untoward happens, there's a little back channel that can go on until it's time to meet formally again in an explicit way. Uh, thank you. Um... <laughs> This is a, a, basically a rule in negotiations. If you are a strong party in negotiation, or you feel that you are a strong party in negotiation, state, for example, it's uh, your preference is to go issue by issue and put in front issues of special importance to you. But if you are a weaker party, which is normally the, the uh, uh, rebel movements, uh, then uh, the pref uh, preferred way is to go, nothing is agreed that, until everything is agreed. So there are also this uh, negotiation techniques. We will have to, unfortunately, to wrap up slowly. So I will take a question from Jonathan for Miriam and Emmanuel. And then uh, I will just uh, uh, ask you to uh, make a last comment uh, after this uh, on, on this topic which is, cannot be properly addressed within one hour. I'm fully aware of this. So question uh, for uh, Miriam first, and then Emmanuel uh, from Jonathan. Should the mediator be one, as culturally close as possible uh, uh, to the parties in conflict? So, so uh, to ensure he immediately, he or she, had a deep detailed understanding of the cultural dynamics and the untold dynamics issues, or two, as a foreign uh, outsider, uh, 
possibly to reassure both parties that he is impartial and has no other interest than a mediated agreement accepted by all parties. So if mediator is coming from another culture, is it preferred way to uh, try to get into the culture of the parties to understand better or to keep away as an as a, uh, outsider and uh, uh, just uh, to, uh, with that, to show impartiality. So in your experience, Miriam and then uh, Emmanuel, please, what, what works better? Um, first of all, we assume that there is only one mediator in any conflict, and that's the big man, or usually a man, mediator sitting in the center of the, uh, you know, of uh, between the two tables. Uh, but actually in any process, there are so many people doing mediation work on the ground at different levels informally and so on. And, uh, but if the reference point is at the formal track, the, uh, the, you know, the formal mediator to a negotiation process, um, I don't think that's the, the sole criteria. There will be obvious difficulties when the mediator speaks a different language and no common language is found. Uh, either the mediator is familiar with their language, even as a foreigner, then that's certainly going to be helpful. Because, uh, but in any case, for many of these conflicts, they probably speak different languages too. The two part, the parties involved, the direct parties involved. So definitely if a common language is found, no matter a foreigner or somebody uh, somebody that's more culturally close, then that should work for a process where talking is the name of the game. Uh, but that's just the language issue. It's very important for the mediator to be equipped precisely with a cultural sensitivity that is very much part of, uh, uh, you know, the the wholeness, the the the, the what what the person brings into into the process. But uh, so many uh, complex factors in the end come together for a successful process. Somebody, on the other hand, who's so far removed from the cultural context has, uh, and uh, somebody who is not adaptable to the specifics of the situation, then obviously that person will not be um, uh, very successful in being able to, uh, to really understand what's going on inside the negotiating room. I mean, there are so many subtexts to any conversation that are going on. There's body language that has to be read. There's the silence that has to be interpreted, things that are be being said obliquely. And if the mediator does not have uh, help in being able to see through this, and that's why in mediation processes, you also have other third parties involved. And all these third parties certainly uh, will help, you know, reconstruct what has been going on and uh, enable um, those people who had the, the head person, who in the, the lead mediator, for instance, really bring together the uh, um, a better understanding, and in that way, be able to steer the discussion more productively. Just uh, Miriam, if the cult, the the parties in the conflict, if they are of opposite, uh, different cultures, and if a mediator shares the same culture as one of the parties to the conflict, can uh, that person be a successful mediator? If mediator is sharing culture of one of the parties in the conflict, it's not the it it. It's, it has its pros and cons, but in itself, it will not determine the outcome. I mean, there are certain advantages when the other party is quite close, when the mediator is uh, more familiar with the other party. And I think that that, that, that happens a lot. Uh, the more secular uh, part, the more secular party probably has more cultural affinity with a very secular mediator. And in that sense, it's the other party that is sort of distanced culturally uh, from, uh, from, from the mediator. But if the mediator is able to uh, bridge that kind of a gap through, uh, through uh, different ways and means of being able to uh, engage the other party and to process precisely, to be able to process, then this 
this kind of difficulty will be overcome. Of course, there will be the suspicion of him being of him or her being biased precisely for the other party due to cultural affinity. But um, these things can be uh, can be handled effectively if certainly um, uh, that kind of uh, neutrality is precisely observed. Thank you very much. Emmanuel, we would appreciate your views. Yeah, uh, I assume, uh, I, I saw the question in the box and uh, Mary, Miriam before me and I assume uh, I should come in. So first of all, I would uh, advise that every situation of conflict is different. And so we cannot apply as a general rule what pertains in one setting to the other. In some conflicts, the question would be, what makes the mediator to have the convening power that brings all parties to be willing to come and sit and talk? The familiarity of all parties, including a deep knowledge of cultures, could be one. But in other settings, it could be the capacity to convene that conversation as a result of the political dynamics in the conflict. But having made this observation, more and more, we want to depart from the idea that the mediator is a single person capable of doing all the things that we want to see happen in mediation. We think we should be advocating more and more to mediation referring to a team of people, even if that team is led by a high level person. But that team then has the expertise to take into account all the considerations in our conversation today. At, at the third level then is to allow the expertise that convenes the dialogue make it very important for all the parties to be able to articulate and bring their perspectives to bear for the understanding of the other. And to be able to see that the cultural impediments require also a process of engagement that requires perseverance and patience to unravel and to transform. And that is why engagement now begins to happen in ways that must be very active and persistent. So when you see protracted conflicts and you barely hear anything going on until people are almost ready to start the war, then you begin to hear people moving around as we are seeing in, in, in Ethiopia. It then challenges our assumptions about how people should be able to sit down and talk so that peace can be reestablished. And so this will be my uh, 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 thinking around this, that the role of the mediator is important, but keep in mind the skill and the expertise is about how the parties feel comfortable enough to engage one another including the earlier conversation about they taking the helm of affairs to tell their story and to interact. Emmanuel, thank you very much. And uh, I would like uh, to invite all three of you for a last uh, comment. And uh, I would try to put a question which summarizes many questions in the Q&A uh, uh, feature. Are cultural differences at the root of conflict? Is it the root of conflict in cultural differences? Or is it the struggle for power and resources, the real cause, but they are framed and represented by cultural identities? So are the cultural differences the root of, of a conflict? Last comment from everyone. Thank you very much. We'll start maybe with you, Alistair. Milos, um, I'm afraid if it was to me, I did not hear anything. Yeah. Um, Milos, of course. I mean, we'll get into troubles with definitions of how widely, but as I was indicating at the outset, all of history is cultural. 
because what history is, is the victor's version of events. And the other history is the history of what's left out of that history. Um, and I think I would just say the last quick points, because I know we're over time, um, is what do you do? How do you address it? How you prepare yourself for it? And I would say, you know, we've all talked about microcultures at this point, but there's also a macroculture. We are all here in this room, one way or another, products of Western culture. Western academic culture or Western culture in one way or another. I am the product of that culture. So one of the things you have to do is a process of deep checking. And the deep checking is uncomfortable and could mean the sort of decomposition of your own way of thinking, of your own cultural sense. In, a, in, a, in certain societies and in the old world, it was never thought that you would be able to understand anything like this until you had had your own, if you like, a hammer taken to the, um, uh, to the rhetoric, to your sort of crucible in which you exist, to the sphere th that is your mental capacity. So, you so this is the self-checking, to be aware that you too are carrying a culture. You may think you rise above it, that is somehow you're distanced from it and you're more rational. We're not, it's just the same. We have to check ourselves continuously as, a, as a, a mediator to be aware of what we present to others, even unconsciously. Thank you, Miriam, please. Well, when you talk about the victor's history and uh, the, as against the conquered, uh, then definitely we're talking about power. And it is really this imbalance of power, the way power has been exercised that politicizes culture and make it, uh, make it the, you know, some kind of the, uh, the, uh, the rallying point for political mobilization, including armed mobilization. So really cultural diversity in itself is the beauty of, of a human society. It is not the source of the conflict per se. It becomes conflictual when from our social differences, it becomes essentially um, expressed in terms of precisely the political, uh, the questions of political power or political um, imbalances that create, can create uh, these kinds of um, uh, perceived unjust, perceived and unjust uh, situations. So uh, the, uh, uh, at the root of most of the conflicts that we see today expressed between, uh, say, uh, you know, interstate conflicts between sub-state uh, territorial conflicts that uh, we see, that precisely are, are these this situations beg for some kind of reordering precisely of the power and resources that, are ex that exist within that context. And to that extent, um, it is not culture per se that uh, that uh, that uh, has that creates the conflict, but the culture cultural context, the cultural expression, the, the conflict can be expressed in in terms of uh, uh, cultural differences that have become extremely politicized and mobilized, uh, especially using uh, violent means. So let's not blame culture for what's going on in this world, let's exalt in culture and make sure precisely that these different cultures can can exist uh, peacefully. And, uh, but yeah, that requires a lot of uh, unpacking, unpacking of uh, the different histories that have become conflicted, conflicted over, over the decades. Excellent, thank you very much. Emmanuel, please. You're muted. Yeah. Yes, Ambassador Struga, I just heard you mention my name and it went off. I did not follow a question. It's been frustrating <laughs> today. But if you could repeat, maybe I could pick it. Last comment. Are the cultural oh, okay. 
had a cultural difference. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I, I hear you. First, first of all, let me say that I had a peculiar problem about audio. I don't know. Everything looks perfect except the audio. But I think this conversation has to continue. It is part of us in terms of the complexity. And it is not something we can put aside because you can never try to make how you search for peace simple in order to arrive at that peace. We have to understand that the more we find ourselves in the complexity, the more we continue to have a conversation that, that informs one another, that informs us about how we went through the complexity. And my excitement is that our community is global. And I can learn a lot from Miriam from the Philippines to inform a lot of issues that I am going through in West Africa and vice versa. And so the more we have these types of conversations, the more we inform ourselves to be better, not because we have solutions, but because in conflict, particularly the ones that are protracted, people want us to be present. People want us to be present so that we can hear what they are saying. Why do they want us to be present? Because they know that we come from a community in which we have shared knowledge with others. And we might bring in insightful observations that might be useful for them. And that the more we do that, the more we have a changing landscape about how we are building peace. My second observation is that the complexities are increasing. They are not reducing. The conflicts are increasing. They are not reducing. And there are extraordinary conditions that are adding to that, the impact of uh, climate change and all the things that are associated with it. And in Africa, particularly, when you look at nomadic headers who must have a lifestyle that should coexist with agriculturists or farmers, how do we in the conversation continue to think ahead about being very good at accompanying communities, accompanying parties, and also acknowledging that because the conflicts are intrastate, we need to build more national capacities in order to be able to come out of this. I appreciated this conversation, even from my side, there were difficulties and we look forward to the opportunity again uh, to be part of this rich conversation. Thank you so much, Ambassador Sugar. Uh, luckily, we were able to hear you very well, uh, Emmanuel. Uh, thank you, Miriam, Alice, uh, Emmanuel, for this uh, inspiring and insightful exchange. And as uh, uh, Emmanuel said, it is our intention to continue. This is a follow-up to the conference, which we organized at the beginning of January, jointly with the China Foreign Affairs University and the University of Arts in Belgrade. And we are planning other activities and the joint platform. And please follow us on our website, culture in mediation, one word, cultureinmediation.org and with the updates on, on this topic. But we definitely are determined to continue to explore more uh, about the role of culture in conflict in general and in mediation and negotiation in particular. Uh, thanks to all of you who joined via Zoom. The conversation uh, has been recorded and it will be posted on our website, cultureinmediation.org, and also our social media. Lastly, uh, I would like to mention that uh, our three institutions um, are, are jointly organizing a virtual live course, uh, Resolution of Cross-Culture Conflict Through Negotiation and Mediation, How to Manage the Culture Dimension in uh, Conflict Resolution, uh, from 29 November to 3rd December. And you can find the program and more details on the website. And once again, thank you all and uh, goodbye. And thank you, Milos, for having organized it and taken us through it. Thank you thank very you, much. Thank, thank you for taking part in this. Alistair, Miriam, Emmanuel, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.